Kirby, just wanted to see if you had any updates on Ernest Green, Raylan Wilson, Branson Robinson. Uh, Ernest uh, was able to go yesterday some of the time. He's dealing with a little bit of an ankle sprain, but he, he worked out and ran Monday, and um, he practiced probably about 50% of the reps uh, yesterday, so we think he's going to be okay. Uh, Raylan's still dealing with a hyperextended knee. Um, uh, Branson had a significant injury yesterday. He had a non-contact ruptured patella tendon, so he will be out for the season. Tough, tough break for him. Um, he was, you know, coming back from a toe injury on the other leg, and uh, he, he, he actually was not even in a contact drill. He cut and planted and um, ruptured the patella tendon. So unfortunately, he'll get a full recovery, but he'll be out for the season, which, you know, puts us in a tough situation at back. Um, Kendall's still, Kendall's actually taking some more reps. He's been able to do some things, but he's not 100%. And uh, Andrew is getting a ton of reps. Uh, Rod Robinson is getting a ton of reps. Cash uh, is getting a lot of work. Um, so, you know, it'll be done by committee like it always has been here. I hate it for Branson because he had really worked hard, you know, he, at the end of the spring when he had the turf toe, um, you know, he was battling back all off season. He's had a great summer and uh, looked really good uh, in the days leading up to uh, this injury. Yeah, Coach, I think you talked a little bit about it last time we got you, but what does that transition look and feel like from I'm preparing my football team for the season and I'm preparing my football team for an opponent? Um, it's very different uh, in terms of what we do at practice. We do a lot more um, against each other while we're preparing for the season. Um, it's a lot more about mental toughness, going in the heat, pushing through, uh, developing the entire roster. Uh, when you start talking about game planning for a game, it's exactly that. You know, you start game planning for a game. Now, we're, we're not to that point yet. We're not, we're not working on uh, – our opponent, we, we, we take this week and work on several of our future opponents so that we have footage and material and uh, I would say 25% of the practice is focused on an opponent and 75% of the practice is focused on us because at the end of the day we're trying to get us better. But by Friday our focus will have turned to, uh, to our opponent. <clears throat> Kirby, obviously we're getting a chance to talk to Carson today. Uh, for the first time as QB1, I just wonder from your vantage point, having uh, gotten to know him real well over these last four years, what kind of uh, sort of intangibilities do you see that he has, you know, particularly personality in the locker room and, and now trying to lead an offense? Yeah, I'm never in the locker room with him, so uh, he may have a different <laughs> personality than, 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 than I'm used to. He, uh, he's very bright, very intelligent. He understands situational football. Uh, he's a product of being here uh, three seasons, I guess it is. I mean, he, he, he's been around, so he understands the demands that we put on the quarterback, but he also understands the demands that uh, I put on situational football. So there's not a day we go out there that we're not working on some specific situation at the end of the year. That helps having been through that and seen – how JT handled it, how Stetson handled it, how other guys handled it. So he's, he's wise and uh, he's intelligent and he's got a, a personality that I think the, the, the team draws to because he's relatively quiet and uh, doesn't show a lot of emotion. So I think they have uh, embraced him and uh, he's done a great job uh, in this fall camp. We talked to Malachi last night. He just talked a little bit about Javon moving back there to safety and, and sort of what it's like to have that veteran back there. Even going back to the spring, how do you feel like Javon has handled that move and everything that comes with it? I think more has been made of it than it is. He played that in high school. It's what we recruited him as. The first tape I remember watching, he was playing the, the deep part of the field, I call it. So the spatial awareness is important back there. The angles are critical. Um, decision making is different than at nickel. But you know, when he came here, he had not played nickel. So the questions were more about nickel star than they were about safety. Um, he's gotten more reps. I think it was more about learning our terminology. He's picked that up. Um, Coach Muschamp's done a tremendous job giving him confidence, allowing him to grow, make plays, and um, he continues to get better. I mean, in a lot of ways, he reminds me of Chris in terms of stature. He plays bigger than he probably is. Uh, he's very intelligent, uh, and he, he, he makes a lot of plays on the ball. 
Kirby, you've um, you've dealt with crowded quarterback rooms and potential transfers. I guess like everyone else, as as far back as everyone else, and you've talked about how that position is different, and that only one can be on the field. And you know, McElroy puts out this stat that a top fifty quarterback recruits from seventeen. Carson's the only one still around. How have you managed uh, Carson? And how have you seen Carson grow? Where he's he's still here, even though he hasn't started a game going into his fourth year. I think I think that's Carson's question to answer more than anything we, we don't we don't try to manage the players or manage that we, we coach them and we tell them that by choosing to come here we're going to coach you we're going to coach you and develop you and give you reps and nothing that we've told Carson or Gunnar or Brock is is not the case we're going to develop you we're going to give you lots of reps we're going to guarantee you more reps here than we think you can get anywhere else and i mean meaningful reps in terms of uh, competitive third down situations challenging you growing you um what you want to become as a quarterback what they want to emulate in the nfl they're going to get to learn that here and uh carson's seen that he's seen that uh, uh every year and uh you know he's been He's been as close as there is to starting and then as far away as, as number two or three at times. And and at this point, he's he's the guy that gives the best chance. So I know he's embracing it, but I, I don't think he's looking backwards at, at okay, should I stay, should I go? I, I, I just think he's been where his feet are and he's really grown as a player and he's had some really good quarterback coaches to work with him. Yeah, Kirby, I think it was either you or one of the players last fall who said Mike Hell was a guy who was always out there getting extra work after practice and things like that. How have you seen him develop, I guess, through the spring and summer going into this year where he's maybe got a lot more expectations and, and a, maybe a bigger role to play in the defense this fall? Yeah, uh, number one, he is an extremely hard worker, but he has not had uh, extra work in spring and fall because he, had, he, he wasn't able to go, you know, about, I guess it was a couple of days into the spring. I don't know how many practices he got in the spring before we made the decision to uh, go ahead and have his uh, surgery done. And uh, once he had that, he was in the healing stages. He wasn't able to start ramping up until like mid-July. So it's still a, a, a conditioning process for him. He has really good toughness. He has uh, a really good effort. Um, I think the biggest thing for him right now is can he play more snaps stamina wise without the training that some of our guys would have had over the summer so we're trying to uh, increase his ability to play more snaps because we certainly need him to play as many as he can Kirby how much does Branson's injury and just kind of change your all strategy going forward do you want to like develop further down the depth chart so that you're as strong as you can be at running back going into the year or does it say that you know you have to you know live with being more of a passing team no i wouldn't I, it's not going to affect our run to pass ratio we have capable backs uh he was one of our better backs and uh, when healthy last year we think he was kind of coming into his own he was learning how to pass protect he was learning how to do this and he he had a really good spring while he was going so we were really excited about where he was headed he was explosive twitchy um could do some things uh in pass pro and running the ball that maybe some of the other guys guys couldn't do but um we're not going to have that luxury so we have other guys that can do it i don't think it changes philosophically when you've got kendall milton dejon edwards cash uh and andrew paul who who's had a good camp uh, although he's coming off an ACL, and then Rod. I mean, we've got capable backs there, and we've got people around them to get the ball to. So I, I don't see that changing who we are offensively. It's just, uh, you know, it probably makes uh, another injury more significant. It makes you rethink, you know, what special teams roles do you want the backs playing because you you got to be aware of, of at what point um, there's a drop-off. Kirby, have you settled on a kicker yet? And who is working at the return positions, punt return, kick return? Yeah, punt return, we've done it by committee. I mean, Lad's been back there before. Muse did a good job in the spring, has been back there. Dom um, has done it both at Missouri, and he's done it here with us since arriving. Anthony Evans, Yazid. So we got five or six guys working punt returns, kickoff returns, Muse, Dylan Bell, uh, Dejan, uh, we've Jonell back there. Um, Malachi's been back there. I mean, Kickoff returns, probably six guys working for two spots. Pump returns, probably four or five guys working for two spots. I wouldn't say we've settled on anybody at either location yet as we continue those. 
And then uh, field goal kicker's been a really tight race. They've both been uh, been extremely accurate outside of the one scrimmage, and we haven't decided yet. Kirby, I wanted to ask you about the offensive line and specifically the interior spots. You know, Micah, uh, Dylan Fairchild. How how have those guys kind of come along through spring and and preseason, and and how close are they to kind of breaking in and 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 earning some snaps there? I know you guys have rotated on the offensive line some. Yeah, both uh, Dylan and Micah have had tremendous springs and fall camps. Uh, Mike has been a little dinged up, so he's missed a few reps in and out, but he's he's uh, he's really uh, significant on, on trap plays and pulling plays. He's physical. Uh, he doesn't shy away from contact. He gets movement. Um, again, he needs to improve his stamina to be able to play uh, to the level of a starter consistently every snap. Um, Dylan's had a great camp. Dylan's worked at, at tackle and guard. And uh, he's done a great job. He's really physical. I think he's kind of come into his own where he's he's one of our strongest weight room players. And you can see that taking effect uh, uh, with the offensive line. I mean, I look at those two guys as starters, and they can play and, and, and roll and play in there with those other guys. Kirby, how have you seen Dana, Dana Eilon Morris that kind of come into his own, you know, coming back you know, from his uh, suspension? Um, Denial's done a good job. He's, uh, he's dealing with a little bit of a growing injury uh, right now. He had a sports hernia on the other side, and he's, he's, he had a growing yesterday that started bothering him. But the, the first couple of days he's been out there with us, he's done a really nice job and uh, competitive, tough. He brings something to the receiver room in terms of physicality, uh, but probably haven't had the whole body of work that we've had with the other players to, uh, to judge it. Kirby, we talked to Dominic, Dominic Lovett here shortly, and what was it that you identified from him that made you want to seek him out as a transfer when it's obviously you're not taking too many transfers into the program? Well, we felt like he gave us uh, a depth and, and gave us a, a playmaker at, at, at positions that we needed it. I mean, we, we, we were going to lose some good wideouts last year. We lost a couple in the last couple of years, and we played against him. So we had seen him in high school. We knew about him in recruiting. We saw what he did to us when we played him and just felt like he was a, a really good player and a good asset to the program. And once we were around him and knew what kind of person he was and his family, uh, we thought he was a good fit and a good match. And he's been just a tremendous blessing. I think he's he, he'd be the first to tell you uh, uh, the demands and what we're asking him to do every day at practice is taxing him. Uh, more, but it's making him uh, a more, uh, hopefully, ho hopefully getting to be a more complete player, which is what he wanted. <clears throat> yeah, you've coached obviously a lot of great players in your time, both at Georgia and Alabama. And with Brock and Brock Bowers in particular, you know, guy does everything right, great competitive excellence. How does you know him being as great as he is maybe challenge you or push you to be a better coach to try and get the most out of a guy who just intrinsically always seems to do that? Yeah, I think you would see that uh, with Coach Hartley and Coach Bobo a lot. For me, it's not so much about just Brock. It's about our team and how can I provide that same service to every player on the team. Um, I think if you ask Coach Hartley that question um, when he was up here, and he'll tell you the guy challenges him every day because you're trying to create um, ways to make him better. And uh, he's certainly um, at his best for a long time and, and longer than most players can sustain because he's in really great shape and he's – He's tough and he's competitive. Uh, and then our offensive staff is charged with finding ways to, you know, be creative to use him that, that, that maybe the defense isn't used to. Um, but for me personally, he's, he's, a, he's a guy on the team that, that, that leads by example. And if every player could take care of their body and work as hard as he did, we'd, you know, be in a phenomenal place. Following up on the O-line coach, I actually a, tra a transition at, at either tackle but much less both is usually a you know pretty big deal for an o-line but it seems like every term we've asked about it there's a lot of confidence in the Marius Mims and and the two guys that are working primarily over at the left tackle can you just talk about how you feel about uh, that transition and, and Mims in particular sort of making that step to to be in you know kind of the guy it seems like yeah, uh, Mims was a starter last year, in my opinion. He he, he reffed us a starter. He can't all camp. He played us a one. Uh, he's flip flopped and played both sides. He played in really big football games as a starter. So uh, having him back is like having a returning starter back. 
Uh, Ernest was unable to go at this time last year. Otherwise, he probably would have been in that conversation. He would have gotten some playing time, but he had a pretty significant injury this time last year, and he's done a great job coming back from that. We're probably not in the same location in terms of depth. Obviously, Blasky and Ernest have been competing for that, that spot, and, and, and Blasky's played uh, really well. Um, he's, he's had more struggles this fall camp than he has any other time in terms of the heat has been so different. Um, but uh, those three guys will provide depth. Xavier Truss has repped out there and played, um, and then Monroe gets out there and, and gets repped. So we, we're like everybody else in the country. You're constantly in need of tackles. So we've tried to rotate guys and make sure that we have a, a fourth and fifth and sixth answer should we need that. Kirby, how have you seen Malachi grow as he goes into his second season, and, and what are the next stages of that development that you want to continue to see? Yeah, the next stages are more leadership, uh, more vocal, which is not natural for him. He's a he's a quiet, intelligent, very consistent kid. Uh, I think it's important that a guy like himself that never had to go through the struggle of of fighting to earn things. I mean, he came in and he was talented, and we needed him. So, you know, if we had had two returning starters and he couldn't have beat one of them out, then he wouldn't have been in that position. He would have had to struggle through what some of our other players struggle through. He didn't get that. So the struggle for him is how do I consistently work to get better and not be happy w with where I am? And he's not wired that way. He's a hard worker and he's very conscientious, comes from a great home. And uh, I don't think that'll happen, but we as coaches have to keep, you know, we owe it to him to make sure he gets better each and every day. Uh, Kirby here to your left. Uh, I know every team and every season is unique, but given the backdrop of the last two years, um, what have you learned sort of in terms of preventing guys from having sort of this sense of entitlement going into the season? And then I'll have a follow-up too. Um, you're asking what now exactly? Well, in, in terms of the difficulty sometimes in motivating guys um, who given the last two years might have some sort of sense of entitlement. Yeah, I worry about complacency every day. There's not a day that I don't go out on the field that I don't worry about it, but you look for it and you look for signs of it, and it's like a fire. You try to stomp it out. You know, you don't, you don't allow it to happen uh, if you can help it. What prevents that from happening? Well, competition is the first way. Um, second way is acknowledging it and confronting it. And then, you know, the third way is mentally making sure they understand that you're not going to get the same uh, team week in and week out that you might have gotten had you not won two. So, you know, we try to visually paint a picture for our players uh, to see that. And uh, we tell them that the, the biggest threat we have, the biggest opponent we have the entire year is Georgia. And I think they respect that. And we spend a lot of time trying to cover that. And we, we do that regardless of what we did the previous year. So it's all about what we do and not really what our opponents do. And that's how you avoid the complacency factor. Got time. Two and, more questions. And then a quick, quick follow-up. You, you faced a situation maybe to a slightly lesser degree last year. But after, after the second championship, some things were said by players about nobody thought we were going to win. One player said we were going to go 7-5. and five. You said whatever you said you know, at the victory parade. It seemed apparent that somewhere along the way, you either sort of lied or skewed the truth in terms of what was being said or written out there. I'm just wondering, could you sort of acknowledge that now and, and to what degree and how often do you actually do that? I, I, I never thought, if, if anybody, if I ever thought we were going to go seven and five, they need to, they need to check me into a psychiatric ward because I never thought that. I never said that. <laughs> I never expressed that. You know, that's never been a thing. I, I saw something where a player said that on the field or something, but that, that you know, these, these players read more stuff on Twitter and social media than I do. So what I paint to them is maybe a level of disrespect before maybe one game or two games, but not a season or not a thought of that. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that works when you're Georgia. I just don't think that works. I, I think what works is what are we doing this week against this opponent to be better than them? And a lot of times we may – be line up and be favored or be better than them. So then what are we doing to ourselves to make sure that we're trying to beat everybody in the country and not somebody? Um, I'm a lot more passionate and adamant about what we're doing over 
what we're selling us, what the outside world might say, or this narrative that is like you, you need this narrative of uh, the world against us. I, I think we may have had that once or twice last year, but that that's not something that we're painting the whole time, and we're certainly not trying to paint that this year. We're, we're, we're focused on better never rest. I'm, we're focused on being the best we can. I'm sorry, correct me if I'm wrong, but did you have some comments at the Victory Parade, something, I don't know the exact word, it's something they wrote, the fact that nobody believed in us or whatever it was? A lot of people doubted us throughout the season. And, you know, you go back and watch some of the games before we played a team that was ranked higher than us. So that may have been a case for one game, but not necessarily the whole season. Last question. Yeah, Coach, you talked about asking the question about sticking around for Carson, but it's not necessarily just Carson. 18 of that 20, uh, that COVID class, that yeah. COVID babies have stuck around. What's been the key to this program in the retention rates? And I asked this, or we asked this question to Coach Harley. He attributed it to practice. What's what specifically are y'all doing in practice that makes guys want to stick around this place? I don't know. If you did it based on practice, they'd probably want to leave because they, uh, they, they have tough physical practices. I, I do think that the first th question is what do you bring into your program? So if you're bringing kids in that like hard, that want to develop, and they truly all say that in recruiting, but if you actually get the ones that want to develop and want to grow and get better, they embrace hard. They embrace the challenge of uh, being physical at practice and doing that. But as far as our retention, it's investment. It's the same thing you do in anything else. If you invest in your uh, organization, your people, your employees, your, 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 your players in this case, guess what? They're usually going to want to stay because they have a sense of uh, wanting to do well and servicing each other. We, I promise you, we spend a lot of time on how can we improve our freshmen? How can we improve our sophomores? And we get return on that investment towards the junior and senior year. And I'm not talking about improving them with a drill. I'm talking about improving them mentally and physically so that uh, they can go out there and succeed in tough environments. So we've been able to keep a lot of those guys because we spend a lot of time with them. Thanks. Thanks.